Hey, grace and peace to all who have gathered here this morning. It's good to see you all on this wonderful fall day. Uh, as you know, it's a very special day for us, so let me welcome all of you who are both worshiping with us uh, live and uh, also those who may be worshiping with us online. Uh, we are glad to have you here. Uh, it is a special day uh, for us because it's our 35th anniversary as being a reconciling congregation. Um, yeah. Um, I wasn't here when that decision happened, but I, I know that it was um, a courageous one, uh, both in terms of the life of this congregation and in the life of Oak Park, which has not always been kind of the Oak Park that we know we know now. Um, so uh, it's a big it's a big day for us. We celebrate. We're also celebrating our 125th anniversary as a church. It's good to know that 35 of those 125 years, uh, we got it right. So thanks be to God. <laughs> this morning, we also want to welcome uh, our friends. Uh, we have with us this morning, uh, Dr. Rolf Nolasco, uh, who is uh, pastor of, uh, uh, who is the professor of pastoral theology at uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, which is in itself a mouthful. Um, but he also, uh, there at the seminary, serves as the Reuben P. Job uh, Professor of Spirituality, Spiritual Formation, and uh, we're excited to have him with us. Some of us had the opportunity to, um, to hear him uh, speak at our annual conference uh, this past year. He led the Bible study, and uh, I was just blown out of my socks. I just really was, so I'm excited uh, for what he shares today. Uh, he'll be speaking on the queer Christ, uh, worthy. And uh, also we have a PhD student with us today as well, so we'll uh, keep him in our prayers. Uh, also at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, good to have you with us. Um, and we also have uh, friends from Artemis, um, Artemis Singers, who are with us. Uh, and they're going to be, uh, yeah, let's welcome them. We'll be announcing uh, their award a little bit later on in the service, but delighted to have them here. I just know the singing's going to be better this morning, so that's uh, that's great. That's great. Hey? Okay. And uh, this morning, we also want to welcome all the rest of you who have come, those who are regulars, those who may be visiting for the first time. We're absolutely delighted to have you. We also I want to share, uh, uh, for those of you who are part of the congregation may not know yet, that we also have uh, upstairs um, in the uh, educational wing, we've uh, taken in 17, 17 um, asylum seekers who are now with us for the, for the long haul until we can get them into uh, to housing. Uh, so there are a lot of sign up genius uh, sheets that have been going out. Uh, your love and care in the last two days has just been uh, yeah, heartwarming. That's all I can say. I mean, you know, we made a call for cots and pillows and food and uh, coats and towels and all kinds of things, and you all have just shown up uh, in the most marvelous way. And uh, for Maggie Ramirez, who spent the night, and for Dot Roach, who spent the night, I don't know if Dot's in the, she's probably upstairs with folks right now, we're trying to arrange showers, but Dot's just been our point person. Uh, Dr. Camilla, who's coming in here, was over here doing wellness checks with folks yesterday, uh, and we learned that she spoke Spanish. I didn't know that, so, so, uh, as well as everything else, so just really grateful. Um, they're still getting settled up, upstairs, uh, and then they'll be moving downstairs to have their own space um, later on this afternoon. And we hope by next week, when things have settled up a little bit, they'll be able to join us for our Thanksgiving service uh, and our meal afterwards. So we'll all look forward to that. So. Uh, like I said, it's a big day. Later on, 3 o'clock, we'll have our uh, Miles Sutton uh, featured in the Oak Park Journal. Yeah. Uh, Miles uh, will be having a piano concert here this afternoon at 3 after everything. So just a great and glorious day. We're excited. Let's worship, eh? Uh, let me invite you to stand as you are able, and let's join into the call to worship. Gather us in, O oh God, we who are a grand spectrum of your children. Prisms that cast your light in the sphere of life. And give it back in a variety of blended hues. Gather us in, O oh God, as dancing colors of a rainbow in the sky. For our very being is 
is the fulfillment of your promise. Friends, let's continue standing if you're able, and we'd love to, and gather us in is in the Faith We Sing. That's the black paperback hymnal uh, that is in your pew, and the words will also be projected on the uh, wall behind me. That's number 2236 in the Faith We Sing. Gather us in. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture passage for this morning can be found in Luke chapter 6, verses 47 and 41. I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood arose, the river burst against that house, but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, it quickly collapsed, and great was the ruin of that house. The word of the Lord.
So this morning we generally have our children come up for our time together, but uh, Bridget's going to go ahead and take the kids and they're going to go off to uh, church school, make sure we have enough time for um, our speaker this morning as well. So kids, I owe you one, uh, but there's cake afterwards, all right? So we're still good? We're still good? All right. Thank you. Uh, this morning we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Nolasco with us. Um, and. Uh, I think I'm not going to say too much uh, other than uh, uh, this is a man who does everything. Um, he is, uh, you know, running an institute at Garrett. That was always a big deal when I was there, uh, to have that administrative responsibility, teaching, advisees, PhD candidates, uh, and uh, writing and doing some really terrific work. I really hope that as this year goes on, now that we've had an introduction, uh, to uh, Dr. Nolasco's work that we'll have an opportunity as a congregation to uh, read uh, some of the things that he has written. So then, my friend. Thank you. Did I just put the children off of the sanctuary today? <laughs> Reverend uh, Dr. Marty Scott, thank you for this humbling invitation to be in fellowship with you all this morning. And my deepest gratitude goes out to all of you, my brothers and sisters and queer siblings in the Lord, for your unwavering commitment in supporting not just the cause, but the thriving and flourishing of the queer community. As we consider the parable this morning, I want to focus on the image used by Jesus that mirror Isaiah 28, verses 14 to 18, which has at its center God's promise of laying a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Now for most queer Christians, Putting our faith in Christ has not always been a sure foundation. In fact, the preferred interpretation of the word or phrase sure foundation has been used to bruise and bury us because of who we are and whom we love. And they use this rock to clobber us. It becomes a badge of some sort a testament to their allegiance to what they call sacred work. As a result, queer seekers can develop what they call Christophobia, or a revulsion both towards all things Christians and towards Jesus Christ himself. And this evolves over time as a response to the relentless blast of oppressive discourse against our queer sexuality and gender identity that renders our humanity, our thoughts and our feelings, our desires, longings, intentions, and dreams, not just about our sexuality, but everything that constitutes our personhood, suspect, defective, unacceptable, and incompatible with the Christian faith. Now these teachings, have delegitimatized the authenticity of our deepest longing to love, to know, and serve God. That somehow our being doesn't permit us to long and desire and serve God, which in turn has created a wide chasm between our bodily integrity and our deepest spiritual yearnings. So first, with familiar biblical justification and couch in shame and guilt, this oppressive discourse has scarred our souls and demonized our spirituality. And so my question for the longest time in my life is how do we crawl back from under the rubble left by the ruins of exclusion and sacred violence to find faith to anchor ourselves on the chief cornerstone? Put another way, how do we separate Jesus, who was spiritualized, depoliticized, and ecclesialized from the Jesus who got down and dirty 
with those who were despised by and on the fringes of society. How do we disentangle the sanitized Christ from the queer Christ who offers different footing for us to stand on? But what does it mean to imagine Jesus Christ as queer in the first place? We need not look further, my friends in the Lord, than the Jesus portrayed in the gospel who lived and loved out loud in radical ways. Never to be aligned with the elite, the haves, the power hungry, and the dominant, unless to rebuke them of their smugness and spiritual bankruptcy, the Jesus we encounter in the gospel narratives is one who was unapologetically out and about with ordinary folks, dined with the so-called sinners and tax collectors, and stood beside a woman caught in adultery. A queer act indeed. And he not only lived out loud, but he loved so loudly that stirred, that stirred up the pious and the protectors of tradition so much so that they tried to shove his fierce love back into the closet. Much like the religious elites of our day, who are eager to dispense judgment for any fraction of deviance from their established holy orders. Their lust for blood, if you will, is linked to a theological perspective we have come to know as atonement theory, which focuses on the sinful nature of humanity that can only be redeemed by Jesus' sacrificial death. And yet, if we peel back the story we actually discover a deal, a deal whereby someone who was remote and angry remained remote and angry, but created an exception for those who lucky enough to be covered with the blood of his son, a distant, angry God demanding sacrifice, as the Catholic theologian Father James Allison would say. And those covered with the blood of Jesus have to strengthen their lives to keep up their end of the deal. A strange mix of gratitude and fear. And so those outside of the Christianized heterosexual norm must subject themselves to its prescribed beliefs and practices if they want to be saved of all. After all, Jesus died for our sins, and his death an expression of God's unconditional love for us. So how dare we belittle the sacrificial act of Jesus by living as we wish? And by that, I mean living authentically as best as we can. And that logic is actually quite ludicrous. The supposedly unconditional love is conditional through and through. And it capitalizes on guilt and shame which chain queer Christians to psychological insanity and psychological abuse. It is an emotional blackmail, a twisted understanding of what Jesus' death and resurrection mean for us. And so my friends, part of unshackling the queer Christ from the sanitized Christ is to swing the closet wide open and center the cross things that Jesus did repeatedly to most people like us, where we are and as we are. Jesus is the motivation and inspiration that releases the queer community from the clutches of heterosexism. Jesus is undeniably queer in that regard. In fact, Jesus' focus is on destabilizing and disrupting power structures and the relations that keep them entrenched is at the heart of what it means to be queer, the very foundation that will keep us grounded and anchored. This is the Jesus we need to be out. Better yet, we must allow this Jesus, this out Jesus, to queer and query other versions of Jesus that have come down to us to see if they align with the, or distort the divine liberation that God has for us. 
And integral to querying the Jesus we have inherited is to extract, better yet, exercise the sanitized Jesus so deeply entrenched in our psyche that unconsciously thinks in a very straight manner and assumes that all society and religion is and must be straight. This means interrogating images, interrogating our theologies, our spiritualities, and all aspects of our meaning making to see whether they support our flourishing or keep us subjugated in the service of the often unquestioned principle of male as the norm. The unquestioned principle of dominance and submission, of hierarchy and possession. Now this critical and soulful work can be facilitated in myriad ways. But let me describe briefly what this means. Our collective queer work, the fact that you've got rainbow flags everywhere, and I get to wear a colorful stole, is already a testament of your commitment to do this queer work. And queer work is always reflexive and critical. But to add soulfulness to this urgent work brings in another dimension, more bodily and more lived in. Not simply cognitive, but also sensory. Not in isolation, uh, but in community. And in a sense, it allows for open and unrestricted dialogue about queer matters. Lament often accompanies this soulful work, given the pain and trauma we harbor in our bodies for so long, which we must release as our way of consenting to live freely, authentically, and queerly. But there is also tenderness perhaps extended to us by those who provide a shelter and a footing, which we can now offer ourselves as a gesture of self-love. And then gradually, perhaps, we can embrace fully the gift of our erotic desires and the carnality and sanctity of our bodies as our way of owning and celebrating our humanity in its manifold forms and expressions. This, in a way, is a form of resistance, the lived and living unapologetically in and through our queer body. My queer siblings here at this moment and those watching online, we need not hide or be ashamed of our bodies or mold them into this heterosexual standard. Our bodies are marked signified, even singled out to make manifest or signal what is possible. Calling us back to the talents or purpose of our existence as humans, to be people invested in the flourishing of all and in all possible ways, bodily, psychologically, spiritually, relationally, both with people and the planet we share. Isn't this why Jesus came in the first place? Not as a thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy, which we humans continue to do to one another, but as one who came that we may have abundant life, generous in love, extravagant in how we treat one another and how we care for the world, in our queer bodies, standing securely on this foundation that is queer Christ, let us lean in again and, and lean into what God is saying to us at this time. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Our queer bodies that inhabit the world with fairness and courage day in and day out, are sanctified bodies, bearers of the image of God, icons of the spacious, transforming love of God that inflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. It is not only a transgressive signifier of radical equality, 
But the queer body is also transgressive signifier about what it means to be open, hospitable, affirming, and celebratory of differences that make up the human community. In the process, our understanding of what it means to be human, bearing the image of the queer God is queered, reshaped, offered as a transgressive challenge to straight talk. To put it more bluntly, our queer bodies open the cracks and make visible the crooked, straight mind. <coughs> the political and religious significance of the sanctified queer body is immense on another level. The normative heterosexual body that has been rendered natural and sacred and is seen as the carrier of dominant values get all flustered, undone, and exposed when colliding with the sanctified queer body. They don't really know what to do with us. And they make that as our problem. The presence of queer bodies signals the uncomfortable bitter truth that what, that what has been marked as natural and sacred, that is normative straight body, is actually a contorted, distorted, more version that serves social and religious hierarchy and worldly power. And so to put a stop to this crazy-making ruse, we rise in drag in all of its queer expressions, if only to proclaim the futility and the devious agenda of playing, requiring, and acting straight. I remember as a young person being confronted and commanded by a church elder to act straight, that is to act the conventionally masculine stereotypes, strong, stoic, with a swag, and that this happened just outside of the church, right immediately after worship service that I attended when I was a teenager, proved just how straightly configured and policed the supposedly sacred space was. So for many years, many, many years, I have contorted my own body to fit this heterosexual mold because acting straight has no place or acting bent has no place in a straight religious world. The message is loud and clear, isn't it? And that is, I do not have full or not permitted to mediate the divine because of my queer embodiment. And that is where the UMC Church right now, that we don't have the right to stand before you today to extend God's gratuitous love. The UMC's outright refusal to allow queer clergy full participation in the religious and communal life is actually a testament to how straight religious is and can or should be. And in a way, the church serves the institution of heterosexuality, not the queerdom of God. And they do this to ensure that there is a clear demarcation between what is natural, divinely sanctioned, and considered the norm, i.e. heterosexuality, and what is deviant, demonized, an abomination, and considered incompatible the Christian faith and practice, i.e. queer identity. 
this hegemonic heteronormativity, at least based on my experience, my own experience of collision with it is in fact unchecked, unchallenged, and assume that everyone is expected to be in line and to follow the straight line. The elder of the local church assumed that acting straight is divinely sanctioned. The pastor I served with for many church for many years assumed that God talk is always straight talk. And the assemblage at the special general conference in 2019 assumed that the freedom sought by the queer community within the denomination is out of line. Worse, the proliferation and circulation of this discourse as it unfolded in these spaces and everything else found its legitimacy by co-opting the name of the sacred, which then gave it a quasi-divine status. And so all this bodily and psychical, psychical, um, psychical manifestation <clears throat> collides against the discourse and practices of heteronormativity. And that this is actually prior to all of us. This straight talk circulates in the larger world, in the social domain, is prior to us. And the space already inhabited, shaped and made familiar or compulsory to us by others, and given the power, influence, and reach of the heteronormative discourse and its supposedly sacred status, it collides so fervently against our inner sense of witness of queerness that it often leaves us in a state of confusion, self-doubt, shame, trauma, and despair. But here's the good news. As much as the social other and order or configuration in hierarchies are prior to us, there is another other that preceded all this and is invent invested in our flourishing. Our queer folk, us queer folk, we all are being invited or ushered into a life-changing event by someone prior to all of us, another other whose desire is only to affirm and not thwart and grow and not stymied our unique personhood and its many possibilities. That the process of new creation and a new way of being together is released through the gratuitous love of the queer God, who is. Um, um, it's released through the love of the queer God in Christ. <clears throat> and so in drag, we stand on the foundation that is the queer Christ. Theologically speaking, that means that we have to rethink the significance of Jesus' crucifixion. The sacrificial atonement that has been drilled into us as a way of straightening out our so-called disordered life and love is not true. Instead, we need to see Jesus crossing over to our side and that there is something that is being done for, towards, or at us. We are undergoing something of great personal and cosmic significance. But it is not about sacrifice. It is an invitation to a new, strange, and unfamiliar way of building, of being with ourselves and each other that does not involve self-degradation or revenge. This unfamiliar way of being is not something we can pull off on our own, nor should we try to do so. We have been gifted with the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, make all things new, and produces wisdom and revelation to help us discern with clarity the ways of Jesus from the ways of the world. The queer Christ has inducted us into a new way of life, a new vision, of, uh, a new vision for humanity, an alternative vision of what humans could be or are meant to be in and through our queer body. 
And so as we secure our spiritual sanctuary, our home, on a sure foundation, the chief cornerstone that is the queer Christ, we take on the mind of Christ, the antidote to the straight mind and everything it represents. The example of Christ, as described vividly in Philippians 2, provokes us to focus on loving rightly, on living rightly, that is living in the pattern of Christ's love which is one of radical hospitality and openness as God's beloved and in our shared life together with others as a beloved community, even with those who have wronged us. And as we look to Christ's incarnation as the paradigm of what it means to empty ourselves of both imposed and fabricated shame and the desire to otherize those who have made us feel othered, unworthy and less than human because of our queerness, the Apostle Paul says this directly. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Christ made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on the cross. Now this call might feel strange and evocative of the pain associated with being forced to occupy a place of shame because of our sexuality and gender identity. In fact, it may even seem adversarial and contradictory to the myriad strategies of active resistance we have worked so hard to deploy. Those reservations are legitimate, even warranted, but there is another path that we may not have considered yet. Patterning ourselves after the mind of Christ and his self-emptying example does not mean giving up our agency. As imitators of Christ, we are instead admonished to give up our lack of will to appropriate subjectivity, desire, and agency as those made in the image of God. So we can love boldly and fiercely in the face of exclusion. Christ refused to grasp tightly to his nature or status or honor. And instead, he gave up everything so we can know the fullness of life. He was possessed with so much love that he gave up his place so we can be filled with abundant gifts and fruits of the Spirit that are meant to be shared gratuitously, unconditionally with others. He took the form of a slave so we can be freed from the cycle of enslaving ourselves and others or intrahuman violence. He made all this possible not to shame us or make us feel indebted to him, but to invite us into treating each other as image bearers of a loving, forgiving, and compassionate God. And as the mind of Christ takes hold in us, we also gradually discover that his descent on the downward path of dishonor, suffering, and self-renouncing love is also his way of entering the depths of human vulnerability and by extension, directly experiencing the very depths of our brokenness, suffering, and our alienation. Though we may feel alone, we are not truly. Though we may feel abandoned, we are accompanied always. Though we may feel unworthy, we are loved. Guaranteed. Though these promises may seem so far off at times in our feelings and wounds so overwhelming, we cannot see past them. God's regard for us does not and will never change. And so the foundation is secure and we can withstand the torrent of storms and winds that will come our way. We know 
my queer siblings, that the flood of assault on queer bodies and communities has happened, it is happening, and it will continue to happen in the foreseeable future. We have exposed the crack both in the straight mind and the structure that support it. Defensively, the straight culture will try to contain this by creating a false sense of unanimity and belongingness among their adherents against us. And they will stop at nothing to ensure their privilege and normative status remains. But the parable's central message is clear and urgent. Everyone who hears the words of the queer Christ and puts them in practice is like a wise builder who builds a house on the rock. And in this um, context, in the Palestinian context, and we pause, and we pause to hold space in our hearts. The trauma inflicted upon our siblings in Israel and occupied Palestinian territories. In Palestinian context back in the day, villagers built stone houses only in the summer. And under a scorching sun, they did the back-breaking work of digging until they hit solid rock. In like manner, Embodying the words of the queer Christ takes similar energy, intentionally, and focus attention to find that secure foundation. Digging through deeply entrenched beliefs and practices may be new to some queer folks or a daily practice for others, but the work is necessary, and we do not shy away from it. In fact, it is something that we must do so constantly just to protect our sanity and the flickering flame that keep our hearts ablaze for God. We will falter at times, wobble and perhaps fail, yet the foundation and the chief cornerstone remain steady and firm. The queer Christ is steady and firm in his regard for us, steady and firm in his love and that knows no condition. Steady and firm to lift us up so we can continue this journey of claiming liberation and flourishing for all. I'm also reminded of Paul's bold claim that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This gratuitous love that is made available to us, that is already present in us, that is already at work in us, precedes, precedes our failings, rejoices in our victories, and eagerly waits for when everything and everyone becomes wholeheartedly and madly queer. That is where the security of the foundation lies. It rests solely in the love of God in Christ. And lastly, <clears throat> to all of you here in this space and those outline, online, remember this. There is no other place that God would rather be to display God's intention to flourish us. That is to be the sorts of awakened persons and communities who are lovers of God and lovers of all done to be in each of us. Let me say that again, more simply this time. There is no other place where God would rather be than within each of us. And so amid this perilous and sometimes incredibly solitary journey, we will fan into flame this profound longing to be relieved from this induced splintering of our basic humanity. We will keep alive the hope that we are being ushered into an entirely new experience of being Embraced lovingly and unreservedly by God who takes delight and lighting in, in us just as we are. That glimmer of hope 
that you and I carry will never go unnoticed. God in Jesus Christ shatters these false gods and transcends human categories and requirements for inclusion in this unfolding of this new creation. And on that cross, on that cross, with his outreach arms, he calls us to receive the inheritance, our inheritance as fabulous heirs of God. And the empty tomb is a marker of what is yet to come for us, our flourishing, starting from where we are. The configuration of our flourishing, though varied, will bear fruits of personal, social, and political significance. But it is ultimately the manifest work of the triune God in us. Soli Deo Gloria. To God be the glory. Amen. So I have at least uh, two colleagues, two retired colleagues here who were in seminary when I was in seminary in the, in the 70s, uh, Reverend Marilyn Robb and uh, Pastor Siaba in the choir. CJ was there a few years later. And um, all I can say is they weren't telling that story back then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I am so glad that things have changed. Thank you so much for, for liberating uh, preaching a liberating word this morning, thank you. So friends, we, uh, we know um, here that uh, Bruce Scott was a very important uh, person uh, who we didn't meet, but he's a very important person in our lives, brought to us by his, uh, his partner, uh, Larry Bloom, when he was living over here at the Oak Park Arms. Uh, Bruce ended up suing the United States government and winning uh, back when he was, uh, a, basically fired, let go from his uh, federal job uh, when uh, McCarthy found out uh, back in the 50s that, uh, uh, that he was gay. So many of our veterans, as we're celebrating Veterans Day this weekend, so many of those veterans uh, who served, you know, in every branch, uh, served for the cause of freedom, came home, were working with, for the federal government, and then when Eugene, or when uh, Jim, when McCarthy uh, couldn't find anybody in the Red Scare, couldn't find any communists, decided that he would go after um, gay and lesbian people and um, would get rid of them. Um, well, that became part of the Lavender Scare, and we're glad to say that uh, Bruce um, was in the center of that, was uh, one of the folks who fought so hard uh, for the sake of others uh, in society. Uh, to be counted as equals and to have the same kinds of rights that other people have. So, having said that, um, solidarity forever. We shall overcome. I am woman, I am strong. Yeah. Welga uh, in uh, in Rock for our farm workers. Um, we are a gentle, loving people. They are songs of protest and struggle. John Lewis said, powerful movements have powerful songs. Mm. Songs collect the people. They spark and they fire up a, a deep nerve uh, inside of us that uh, awakens hope and a sense of healing and a sense of power and meaning and, uh, and love. And we know that uh, there are those who have sung songs for us and sometimes local groups. And we're here to honor uh, one of them today. Uh, we've come to uh, salute the Artemis singers for their uh, 45 years or so of service and uh, modeling that diverse voices coming together uh, can produce harmony and not discord. In the spirit of Bruce Scott, they showed us and gave lesbians and feminism 
uh, a face and a place. Um, they, uh, even, they did that despite the fact that society uh, oftentimes despised them, uh, a church that rejected them, and families that ignored them. 1979, uh, Artemis singers began performing in public and uh, we are so glad they did uh, because, you know, back then a uh, uh, person could have been fired if they were known to be um, a lesbian. Uh, they could have brought violence on themselves and God only knows they would have got kicked out of the ministry in the United Methodist Church. Sexual relations with a person of the same sex were illegal in this country, this great bastion of freedom, until June of 2003. So, songs. Uh, songs sung by courageous women have uh, been a part of powering uh, this movement, this movement for equal rights for all persons. As Mark Miller would sing, you know, from Seneca Falls to Selma and Stonewall. We've come a long way, but the journey isn't over. The Artemis Singers began to perform, as I said, in 79, and they were inducted into Chicago uh, LGBTQ plus Hall of Fame in 2008. And today we just want to add uh, to those recognitions uh, by giving them our uh, Bruce Scott Award. And uh, in doing that, uh, we're gonna invite the Vice President, uh, one of the VPs for the Artemis Board of Directors, uh, Damika, if she's here, uh, to come forward and receive uh, this award on behalf of all of the Artemis Singers. And I know some of you are here, so why don't you just go ahead and stand as well, okay. <laughs> Here's your very own copy of the lavender skier that you can pass around to the group. Amazing, okay. right. thanks. Okay. You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Of course. Excuse me while I do mask physics, as my nine-year-old would say. Um, thank you all so so much. I have been part of Artemis for almost three years. Um, and a little background about me, I grew up in Louisiana um, as a black queer person and so Artemis was the first group of people I was around where I was around so many lesbians, especially intergenerationally. And so this award um, means a lot to myself personally and I know all of the existing past, current, and even future Artemis members so thank you all so, so much. Um, the last thing that I want to share is uh, to invite you all to our winter concert, which is happening in this very space on January 20th. Um, the theme of the concert is embracing the night. And before I leave this space, I wanna share a few words about that concert theme um, from the artistic director, Lorraine, if you wanna wave, wave your hand, Lorraine. <laughs> so the theme is embracing the night and here's how Lorraine describes the theme. It's winter in Chicago, the days are short, the nights are long, it's cold outside so we stay inside. By lamplight we have time to contemplate our lives. In the soft light of night we consider those we love, those we've lost, those we wish we could have been, those we could still become. When we embrace the night, we embrace possibility, the year in front of us, what we will plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. Not just the changes we know will surprise us, but the change that we will make for ourselves. We are gathering strength in the beauty that is the night. Uh, this award is really a perfect signifier for that. So thank you all so much. Thank you. So after worship today, uh, we invite you over to uh, the uh, uh, Wesley Hall uh, for social hour. Have a chance for a little Q&A. 
because I know you, you, you've shared things, uh, Dr. Nolesco, that it, it's going to take me probably a good three-day retreat uh, to unpack, so it'll be good to have a little time with you as well. And Artemis is going to sing. You'll get a little foretaste of what that concert's going to sound like on the 20th of January, so uh, we're excited for that as well. So friends, let us go ahead and continue uh, in our service and uh, come to a time of prayer and uh, know that I, I count it a wonderful privilege uh, to live in the intimacy of this congregation, um, to be able to hold one another and know one another well enough that we can hold one another and name one another in prayer. This morning, uh, we're going to continue to lift up uh, our sick and those who are recovering. Let us also be mindful and uh, hold close those who grieve in our congregation, particularly uh, Reverend Trudy Stringer, uh, as she's lost her husband, Jim. On this Veterans Day weekend, we want to remember all of our veterans, um, especially those who are now serving, uh, Jason and Larry and Alejandro and Matthew and Luke. Let us remember that we honor them best by working for peace every day. Let us also open our hearts to those who live in places of conflict and war and death, whether it's in the home next door, a neighborhood across the street, or a nation across an ocean. Let us also be in prayer for the village of Oak Park and its surrounding areas, that it might find a space for asylum seekers in, uh, in the housing that we have here, and just as importantly, find a place in their hearts to receive those who come to us as angels unaware. As we enjoy some uh, unusual warm weather for this time of year, let us also be mindful of our covenant with creation and to care for it. And then let us also, on this weekend, celebrating our reconciling status. In this moment, let us make a, a place in our beloved community and in our hearts, United Methodist Church, for the GLBTQ plus community, for siblings who are often maligned by our Christian kind, and yet every bit as deserving of God's love. And so we pray, hold us tenderly, Holy One, as we lift the human family to your care, and as we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, in whatever language is the language of your heart, we're calling on God in ways that bring God closer to you. And so we pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So be it. Friends, uh, here at Euclid, we know there are so many projects to get involved with, and you've done that in marvelous ways, from our bins out, side that we're collecting from our collecting of plastic bags uh, to build yet another bench. Blair tells me we're on bench number three now. That's amazing. Um, just all the things you've done. Uh, Roger back there putting in a shower for our newest guest here at, uh, at uh, Euclid. Um, all is good. And let's not remember the community fridge across the street and also this month. Uh, we are giving to United Methodist students actually. Uh, and. Uh, contributing to the scholarship funds of the United Methodist Churches uh, to students uh, all around the country and world. And so having said that, um, let us uh, this day uh, continue as uh, we remember that here at Euclid, we not only preach, pray, and sing for a new heaven on earth, but we put our tithes and our gifts where our hearts are, and then we recommit to a just economy for all. So be it. Ushers.
Please be seated. Friends, our Eucharistic prayer this morning can be found in the Red Hymnal on page 23. And as we gather at this table, I bid to you, may God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our sovereign God. It is indeed a good and rightful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, and in all places and at all times. But on this day, we give you special thanks that you have brought us to life, made us in your image, and enriched us with the gifts of your love. As Jesus taught your people that we should see the gifts of grace in the context of love and mutual regard, may we so affirm who we are. Rejoice in your love for us and for all the family. May we have strength to face those who despise us, have compassion for those who misunderstand us, and have confidence to stand with the community of all the baptized around your table, that with joy we may receive the gifts of new life. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels and with the whole holy communion of company of heaven and earth, may we join their eternal song of praise. Now we remember the Holy One, Jesus, who was not afraid to be different or to show a different way of living and loving. We remember Jesus, the sign and power of the new creation, who led us into your marvelous realms of equality, love, and justice. And we remember on the night when he was betrayed by the one who loved him, and he was led out of the city gates to die for love. On that night when he shared a meal with his friends, and during the meal he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and said, this is my body broken for each of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when the supper had ended, he took the cup, again gave thanks, lifted the cup, and said, this is indeed the new creation that we are going to create together, a liberation for all people, so that we may sing and dance as God created us to be. And so, now may Jesus become real for us as we celebrate the central mystery of our faith. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon your people, spirit of integrity, tenderness, and joy, Set this bread and juice apart from its common use and transform them and us into the body and blood of Jesus. Transform us 
into truly being the hands and feet of Jesus. Allow us to love and to serve. Give us passion and the energy to transform our world into your kingdom. And give us strength and pride in ourselves as we seek to show the diversity of your love. We ask this through Jesus, with Jesus, and in Jesus. So this morning, if I could get a, a little help, um, Sonia, would you and Sean come up and uh, help with communion this morning? Thank you very much. Hey, I just want to say that uh, here when we say all, we know that all means all. all. Absolutely. And uh, that means you all are invited to, uh, to this table. Um, this table isn't about how good we are or whether or not we got it right all the time. This table is about how good God is and that God would turn no one no one away. So we invite you to come this morning by way of the center aisle and uh, you can return by way of the side aisles. Uh, you can put your cup once you have uh, go ahead and consume that. You can put that down in the basket at the end of each aisle. Okay. So food of God for the people of God. Come and let us keep this feast. Amen.
What a joy to be at the table with all of you. So glad you're here today. As we close out, let us stand and sing our hymn of scattering in the black hymnal 2234. Lead on, O cloud of presence. and sendings go, the one that's printed here is a pretty good one. Read it in your own time. Our kids are getting restless here, as I'm sure you are as, uh, as well. So friends, go, go and, uh, and love however it is that you love and uh, be at peace uh, for God is with us and we are not alone. Thank you to all of you for coming here this day. Remember if you uh, like the sound of those uh, Keys up there, three o'clock is the concert today. We invite you back. And now, cake for our bodies, music for our souls, and uh, wisdom for the mind of Christ in all of us. God be with you. Let's go in peace and over here and uh, around here, or you can go back around that way, down the hallway. Uh, we'll all get together uh, over in the Wesley room. Come join us.